Welcome to part 8 of the Harry Potter Odyssey. Can't really quite see the whole box there, but here it is, the Wizards Collection. And here it has been for the past two years. This is the finale to the series, um, which I started back in 2012. So it's been a long time coming, and uh, you know I can't believe that I originally planned to watch everything in this box set and review it within a few days. I, I took a few days off work, I, th I thought I'm going to plow through everything, it just didn't happen. It took me two years to watch everything this set has to offer and uh, it's been a long, a long two years but I'm finally getting to it now. It is Christmas Day and I'm doing this as my gift to you. The people who have been hanging on waiting for me to finish this series and have messaged me and left comments over the past couple of years saying when are you going to finish the Harry Potter series and I'm sorry, I really am sorry that um, it's taken so long to get to but we're finally here. And uh, yeah, first of all, let's talk about the film itself. We of course are, of course, talking about Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. The final film in the series, released in July 2011. I saw it in the cinema, of course, along with everyone else in the world. And yeah, uh, the film itself. Um, my initial kind of reaction was not a good one. Uh, I left the theatre thinking... Uh, there was, there was a, a sense of loss and kind of like... A bittersweet kind of, you know, it's the end of a big series that I kind of always get if it's been a good one. And it had been a great one. And it was like, oh, it's over, you know. But then there was also this lingering feeling in the back of my head that, oh, they were so close, you know. They were so close to making something almost a classic, in my opinion, if they had changed a few things. Now, yes, this is going to be me fully admitting that I am on the kind of the, the side of the fence where I'm like, oh, it should be more like the books, and uh, yeah, I also understand that's not really a, a good stance to take because they are adaptations, and I have, again, in this very series, no, said that, you know, I know they're adaptations, they need to be different, but for me there were two key things, and one other thing that I wish had stayed more true to this book right here, which is, in fact, a first edition release. I got that the day it came out, I went to the midnight launch of the Deathly Hallows, and that was huge, you know, and really, you know, reviewing it all, I think the Harry Potter series is my favourite, you know, story ever told, honestly. Um, but I won't get deep into that because I plan to continue this series a little bit longer and actually talk about the books at some point. But as we're doing this series, um, or this, you know, this run in this series of talking about the box set, let's talk, talk about the film, primarily. Um, the film... I think is great. And actually, in watching it again for this video, I, I feel like I have a newfound respect for it, especially watching all the special features and hearing some of the kind of motivations behind some of the, the things that were done in the film. Um, but also just watch it. It's a beautiful film. It's really well shot. There's some fantastic imagery in it, you know, lots of great special effects, uh, both practical and digital. And it's a great finale. It's a great final battle at Hogwarts. It's done really well. And even the bits that I don't particularly, that I think are the kind of key moments they got wrong, I still think it executed really well for what they are. Um, so let's just get straight into them. And obviously I'm going to assume that you've seen the films, you've read the books, you know everything that happens. The big number one. And again, I'm not going to go through the whole film and review it because, you know, it's been done before. This I'm just going to hit on the key points here. Harry and Dumbledore scene at, you know, King's Cross at the end of the film. For me, it didn't... There was so much that they could have done with that. It, it, it was it was great for what it was, you know, and it was done well. But for me, what I felt was lacking was the emotional part of it, you know. In the book, Dumbledore is crying. You know, he's apologizing to Harry for never trusting him with the full truth. And I felt that was that was vital to the character of Dumbledore. And it kind of brought it all full circle. But, you know, when I was really thinking about it, and I've had this problem with the film for years, ever since it came out, I really thought about it and I thought, you know what, the reason he apologised to Harry and the way that paid off so well in the book was because in the book we get to be inside Harry's head and we know how much he's questioning his loyalty to Dumbledore because he's hearing all this stuff after he died about how Dumbledore wasn't this perfect man and how he had a troubled past and, you know, conflicted past 
uh, with the Gellert Grindelwald and how, you know, Dumbledore might have been, you know, uh, dancing with, you know, the wrong side of, you know, of good and evil at, at one point and, of course, you know, caused the, the death of his sister, Ariana. And that is not really explored in the films and we don't really get, there's no natural way to convey in the film that Harry is distrusting Dumbledore, you know, and for the most part in the film, we just get the sense that he implicitly trusts Dumbledore, really, and only gets, there's only glimmers of, you know, people saying things to him that might question that, but... For me, I, I guess, fair enough, but it can't be a, a case of, oh, well, we couldn't let the scene go on too long, you know, and even in one of the special features, J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter, uh, Harry Potter, <laughs> I can't believe I almost said that, and Daniel Radcliffe, and the, when they sit down and have a conversation, they even say to, to, to each other, there is an audience out there for people who would go and pay to watch six hour long Harry Potter films, but it's not viable. And I think, well, you know, you don't need to go to the extremes, you know. Uh, the second Harry Potter film was the longest, and I feel like an extra 10 minutes for that Dumbledore bit, well not 10 minutes for that scene, but an extra 10 minutes for the Dumbledore bit, and for the other thing I'm, I'm going to talk about, would have made the film 10 minutes longer, really wouldn't have made much difference, you know, it was only about a two hour long film, it could have been two hours, 10 minutes, and you could have really just nailed it, you know? Um, but again, I will admit that there's not enough of that Dumbledore stuff, Harry not trusting him, for Dumbledore to apologise to him at the end, so I, I kind of have, have reneged on that slightly, I guess. Now my, my, my main, actually we'll forget the main part for now, and I'll, I'll go on to the third um, little thing. There's just a, one line from the book, in fact I'll try and find it now while we're here. There's a line I wish was in the epilogue at the end of the film. Because it's the end of a series, everyone's going to be emotional and stuff, and it's quite a, a touching, you know, poignant scene where you see all, you know, Harry, Ron, Hermione grown up and stuff, and there's this line in it, which I really wish had been in the film, and I was waiting for it to happen because I thought there's no way that they're not going to put this line in. It's just fantastic, you know? And uh, it, for me, it kind of undercuts the whole kind of sadness of it ending with a really great joke that kind of stays true to the series, which really has great humour, I think. And uh, I'm trying to find it now in the book so I can kind of give you the um, exact quote. Here we go. On the platform, nine and three quarters, 19 years after the events of the Deathly Hallows. A great number of faces, both on the train and off, seem to be turning towards Harry. Why are they all staring? demanded Albus, as he and Rose craned around to look at the other students. Don't let it worry you, said Ron. It's me. I'm extremely famous. <laughs> Albus, Rose, Hugo and Lily laughed. That, for me, just was perfect Ron, you know, and I really wish that had been in the film where you know, everyone's staring at Harry Potter and, you know, the kid's like, well, what's that? And then Ron's like, oh, it's me, I'm extremely famous. I wish that line had been in there, you know, but yeah, it is what it is. Now, the main thing, the main... Oh, with this film, is the Harry and Voldemort show up, sh uh, showdown. And, yeah, I can I can see why they did the way they did. Um, you know, for me, I kind of felt like they were going for the, the big Hollywood, you know, uh, blockbuster ending with a big fight scene. Um, but David Yates was saying in the special features he wanted it to be more personal to have them in the courtyard, to be just between Harry and Voldemort and no one else around them. And you know what? I say fair play, that is a good reason for doing it. But for me, I feel like you could have had your cake and and eaten it as well in this film because the way you know the book goes, if you haven't read the book or know what happens, Harry and Voldemort have the showdown in the Great Hall and everyone is watching and they're circling each other in the middle and there's no big fight where they're blasting through the castle and stuff, which is a bit ridiculous. Uh, well, I understand why they did it though, I mean it's 10 years building up a film series and people who haven't read the books probably weren't expecting something a bit more impactful um, and not just a dialogue scene, but for me it was such great dialogue and it's just one of the best scenes of anything ever in my opinion, I just love it because not only does Harry kill Voldemort, he explains to him how he's done it, he explains to Voldemort how he's outsmarted him and it's just absolute brilliance, you know, and I think I really wish we'd been in there, because in the film, you know, Harry's like Oh, guess what? You know, maybe Snape wasn't the master of the Elder One. Maybe it was a master to someone else. And then, and then he just throws in that horrible—well, not horrible, but cheesy line. Come on, Tom, let's finish this the way we started it together. Yeah, <laughs> like it's like, oh, you know. I felt like that—that that just didn't. It didn't. I, you know. I actually liked the fight scene. I thought it was very good. And them crawling for their wands, very, very well shot, very well done. You know, a very iconic looking scene and. Um, I, I do feel it's almost kind of like a trailer scene, though. It was like the, the <laughs> that scene was in every trailer, you know, the the firing at the firing each other with the wands and the big, uh, you know, jet of light and everything. Uh, and then just the way Voldemort dies, where he's just like, uh, and it's, you know, it's an impressive special effect, but he just flakes into uh, what looks like bad eczema. 
and that floats away. And I, I did like the, the the sun rose. And it was like a new dawn. You know, Voldemort's dead, a new dawn. You know, I like the uh, the symbolism there. But for me, he just fades into like bits of flaky skin. And I almost imagine Harry walking back into the Great Hall, going, "Just killed Voldemort," and they're like, "Oh, brilliant." I can't believe it. He's done it. This is the end of everything. You know, thank, where's you know, where's the body? Oh, well, there's no body. What do you mean there's no body? Well, I killed him, but he's you know, there's, there's no body. What happened? He just kind of dissolved into flakes. <sighs> At which point they'll probably be like, yeah, he's probably you know. I mean, I just I, I just didn't. No one was there to witness it, and it just kind of took that for me in the book when everyone's there to witness it. It was just so much more powerful, and I wish again they'd gone into the fact that because Harry walked into the Forbidden Forest to sacrifice his own life for his love for all of his friends and everyone, you know, at Hogwarts, he effectively put the same charm on all of them that was put on himself by his mother when she died for him, and it just brings it all full circle, you know. For you know, again, it is cheesy, but you know, it's never said this. This term is never used, but the power of love is what protected everyone. That's why, you know, Molly Weasley was able to kill Bellatrix, and why, you know, no one was able, no, you know, good person dies after Harry uh, sacrificed himself in the Forbidden Forest, because they're all protected by the fact that he died for them. You know, he really did die, it was a part of him that died, and I just, you know, I think that was a great part of the story that wasn't really um, explained in the film, I guess, which I thought was great. And you know, I'll, I'll have a look through the book now, I really, you know, while we're here, doing this in style, um, maybe just read you a bit of the, um, the, the Voldemort um, Harry showdown, which I just thought was just oh, just so brilliantly written, and how you know Harry let Snape uh, let uh, Voldemort know that Snape wasn't his man, and that and all this, and that he wasn't really the true master of the Elder Wand, and I just thought it was brilliant. Um, right, let's have a look through the book then, and try not to lose my kind of train of thought. There's still loads to get through. We'll talk about the special features. Um, so there's Harry, Harry saying he doesn't want the Elder Wand. Um, so, oh, I mean, it goes on for ages, maybe I shouldn't read some of it, but, um, you know, uh, oh, we've got uh, Molly uh, killing Bellatrix. Not my daughter, you bitch. <laughs> a funny line in the film. Um, but anyway, while I'm trying to find this, you know, I thought the film was, you know, great performances, um, especially Dan Daniel Radcliffe. He was brilliant in the film. He just conveys so much without saying anything, and I think that's the mark of a great actor, and just fantastic. I love, by the way, The Prince's Tale. That was impeccably done in my opinion didn't like the fact that snape was in the in the you know godric's hollow kind of cradling lily and crying that image to me wasn't it kind of discounted james a bit too much uh, for me so uh yeah harry i don't want anyone anyone else to help harry said loudly and this is when they're in the great hall kind of circling each other and uh you know uh who are you going to use as a shield today, Potter? Voldemort says. Nobody, said Harry simply. There are no more Horcruxes. It's just you and me. Neither can live while the other, su other survives, and one of us is about to leave for good. One of us, sneer, uh, jeered Voldemort, and his whole body was taut and his red eyes stared, a snake that was about to strike. You think it will be, do you? The boy who survived by accident and because Dumbledore was pulling the strings? Accident, was it, when my mother died to save me, said Harry. They were still moving sideways, both of them, in a perfect circle, maintaining the same distance from each other, and for Harry, no face existed but Voldemort's. Accident when I decided to fight in that graveyard. Accident when I didn't defend myself tonight and still survived and returned to fight again. Accidents, screamed Voldemort, but still he did not strike, and the watching crowd was frozen as if petrified, and of the hundreds in the hall, nobody seemed to breathe but they too. Accident and chance and the fact that you crouched and snivelled behind the skirts of greater men and women and permitted me to kill them for you. You won't be killing anyone else tonight, said Harry as they circled, stared into each other's eyes, green into red. You won't be able to kill any of them ever again. Don't you get it? I was ready to die to stop you hurting these people. But you did not. I meant to, and that's what did it. I've done what my, my, what my mother did. They're protected from you. Haven't you noticed how none of them... Uh, none of the spells you put on them are binding. You can't torture them, you can't touch them, you don't learn from your mistakes, Riddle, do you? You dare. Yes, I dare, said Harry. I know things you don't know, Tom Riddle. I know lots of important things that you don't. Want to hear some before you make another big mistake? Voldemort did not speak, but prowled in a circle, and Harry knew that he kept him temporarily mesmerised and at bay, held back by the faintest possibility that Harry might indeed know a final secret. 
Is it love again? said Voldemort, his snake's face jeering. Dumbledore's favourite solution, love, which he claimed conquered death, though love did not stop him from falling from the tower and breaking like an old waxwork. Love, which did not prevent me from stamping out your mud-blood mother like a cockroach potter, and nobody seems to love you enough to run forward this time and take my curse. So what will stop you dying now when I strike? Just one thing, said Harry, and still they circled each other, wrapped in each other, held apart by nothing but the last secret. If it is not love that will save you this time, said Voldemort, you must believe that you have magic that I do not, or else a weapon more powerful than mine. I believe both, said Harry, and he saw a shock flit across the snake-like face, though it was instantly dispelled, Voldemort began to laugh, and the sound was more frightening than his screams. Humorless and insane, it echoed around the silent hall. You think you know more magic than I do, he said, than I, than Lord Voldemort, who has performed magic that Dumbledore himself never dreamed of. Oh, he dreamed of it, said Harry, but he knew more than you, knew enough not to do what you've done. You mean he was weak, screamed Voldemort, too weak to dare, too weak to take what might have been his, what will be mine. No, he was cleverer than you, said Harry, a better wizard and a better man. I brought about the death of Albus Dumbledore. You thought you did, said Harry, but you were wrong. For the first time, the watching crowd stirred as the hundreds of people around the walls drew breath as one. Dumbledore is dead! Voldemort hurled the words at Harry, the words at Harry as though they would cause him unendurable pain. His body decays in the marble tomb in the grounds of this castle. I have seen it putter, and he will not return. Yes, Dumbledore's dead, said Harry calmly, but you didn't have him killed. He chose his own manner of dying, chose it months before he died, arranged the whole thing with the man you thought was your servant. What childish dream is this, said Voldemort, but still he did not strike, and his red eyes did not waver from Harry's. Severus Snape wasn't yours, said Harry. Snape was Dumbledore's. Dumbledore's from the moment you started hunting down my mother, and you never realised it because of the thing you can't understand. You never saw Snape cast a Patronus, did you, Riddle? Voldemort did not answer. They continued to circle each other like wolves about to tear each other apart. Snape's Patronus was a doe, said Harry, the same as my mother's because he loved her for nearly all of his life. From the time they were children, you should have realised. He said as he saw Voldemort's nostrils flare. He asked you to spare her life, didn't he? He desired her. That was all, sneered Voldemort. But when she had gone, he agreed that there were other women of purer blood, worthier of him. Of course he told you that, said Harry. That he was Dumbledore's spy from the moment you threatened her, and he's been working against you ever since. Dumbledore was already dying when Snape finished him. It matters not! shrieked Voldemort, who had followed every word with rapt attention but now let out a cackle of mad laughter. It matters not whether Snape was mine or Dumbledore's or what petty obstacles they tried to put in my path. I crushed them as I crushed you. As I crushed your mother, sorry. Snape's supposed great love. Oh, but it all makes sense, Potter, and in ways that you do not understand. Dumbledore was trying to keep the Elder One from me. He intended that Snape should be the true master of the wand, but I got there ahead of you, little boy. I reached the wand before you could get your hands on it. I understood the truth before you caught up. I killed Severus, Severus Snape three hours ago, and the Elder One, the Death Stick, the Wand of Destiny, is truly mine. Dumbledore's last plan went wrong, Harry Potter. Yeah, it did, said Harry. You're right. But before you tried to kill me, I'd advise you to think about something you've done. Think and try for some remorse riddle. What is this? Of all the things that Harry had said to him beyond any revelation or taunt, nothing had shocked Voldemort like this. Harry saw his pupils contract into thin slits, saw the skin around his eyes whiten. It's your one last chance, said Harry. It's all you've got left. I've seen what you'll be otherwise. Be a man. Try. Try for some remorse. You dare, said Voldemort again. Yes, I dare, said Harry, because Dumbledore's last plan hasn't backfired on me at all. It's backfired on you, Riddle. Voldemort's hand was trembling on the Elder Wand, and Harry gripped Draco's very tightly. The moment, he knew, was seconds away. That wand still isn't working properly for you because you murdered the wrong person. Severus Snape was never the true master of the Elder Wand. He never defeated Dumbledore. He killed... Aren't you listening? Snape never beat Dumbledore. Dumbledore's death was planned between them. Dumbledore intended to die undefeated, the one's true last master. If all had gone as planned, the one's power would have died with him because it had never been won from him. But then, Potter, Dumbledore as good as gave me the wand. Voldemort's voice shook with malicious pleasure. I stole the wand from its la last master's tomb. I removed it against its last master's wishes. Its power is mine. You still don't get it, Riddle, do you? 
Possessing the wand isn't enough. Holding it, using it, doesn't really make it yours. Didn't you listen to Ollivander? The wand chooses the wizard. The Elder One recognised a new master before Dumbledore died, someone who had never even laid a hand on it. The new master removed the wand from Dumbledore against his will, never realising exactly what he had done, or that the world's most dangerous wand had given him its allegiance. Voldemort's chest rose and fell rapidly, and Harry could feel the curse coming, feel it building inside the wand, pointed at his face. The true master of the Elder Wand was Draco Malfoy. Blank shock showed in Voldemort's face for a moment, but then it was gone. But what does it matter, he said softly, even if you're right, Potter, it makes no difference to you and me. You no longer have the Phoenix Wand. We duel on skill alone. And after I've killed you, I can attend to Draco Malfoy. But you're too late, said Harry. You've missed your chance. I got there first. I overpowered Draco weeks ago. I took this one from him. Harry twitched the Hawthorne wand, and he felt the eyes of Evan in the hall upon it. So it all comes down to this, doesn't it? whispered Harry. Does the wand in your hand know its last master was disarmed? Because if it does, I am the true master of the Elder Wand. A red glow burst suddenly across the enchanted sky above them as an edge of dazzling sun appeared over the sill of the nearest window. The light hit both of their faces at the same time so the Voldemorts were suddenly a flaming blur. Harry heard the high voice shriek as he too yelled his best hopes to the heavens, pointing Draco's wand. Evada Kedavra, Expelliarmus! The bang was like a cannon blast and the golden flames that erupted between them at the dead centre of the circle they had been treading marked the point where the the, the spells collided. Harry saw Voldemort's green jet meet his own spell, saw the Elder One fly high, dark against the sunrise, spinning across the enchanted ceiling like the head of Nagini, spinning through the air towards the master it would not kill, who would come to take full possession of it at last. And Harry, with the unerring skill of a seeker, caught the wand in his free hand as Voldemort fell backwards, arms splayed, the slit pupils of the scarlet eyes rolling upwards. Tom Riddle hit the floor with a mundane finality, his body feeble and shrunken, the white hands empty, the snake-like face vacant and unknowing. Voldemort was dead, killed by his own rebounding curse, and Harry stood with two wands in his hand, staring down at his enemy's shell. One shivering second of silence, the shock of the moment suspended, and then the tumult broke around Harry as the screams and the cheers and the roars of the watchers rent the air. The fierce new sun dazzled the windows as they thundered towards him, and the first to reach him were Ron and Hermione. It, it was their arms that were wrapped around him. Their incomprehensible shouts that deafened him. Then Ginny, Neville and Luna were there, and then all of the Weasleys and Hagrid and Kingsley and McGonagall and Flitwick and Sprout, and Harry could not hear a word that anyone was shouting, nor tell whose hands were seizing him, pulling him, trying to hug some part of him. Hundreds of them pressing in, all of them determined to touch the boy who lived. The reason it was over at last. So there we go. <laughs> there was a mass reading uh, spontaneously. Um, I'm sorry if that bored you, but that is just to me one of the greatest things ever written. I think it's fantastic. But anyway, the film is brilliant. The music is, is great. Great acting. One thing I'll say um, throughout the, the part one and two of the Deathly Hallows films, Dumbledore Gleeson as Bill Weasley, he just doesn't seem that good. He's a good actor. I've seen him in some good films lately, but he's just not good. And I just don't really enjoy, like him as Bill Weasley. He just seems very stiff and wooden. And whenever you see him in the behind the scenes stuff, he seems very awkward and just, it's weird. Anyway, let's get rolling on with the special features. There's a, a massive pile of them. So we have maximum movie mode on the Blu-ray, which is where you have the picture and picture track. Very enjoyable. You know, they have like a kind of a CG set of the courtyard or Hogwarts. And we have various cast members standing in the set with the screen in front of them, the film playing on another screen. One of the best production values I've seen in a picture and picture track. Loads of great stuff. Readings from the, the books, which are really cool. Uh, although some members of the cast are better at reading them than others. Like Emma Watson uh, really like reads the book well, whereas, um, uh, what's his name? Warwick Davis doesn't really <laughs> read books that, uh, doesn't really read it that well. Anyway, uh, you get lots of behind the scenes stuff, deleted scenes added in. As with all these picture in picture tracks, it seems to lose a bit of steam towards the end, but there's never more than a couple of minutes without some stuff. I watched it from start to finish and really enjoyed it. Towards the end, I was getting a bit sick of like, um, this is the invisibility cloak. Remember when we saw that in film one and film three? And it shows you all the clips and it's like, towards the end it gets kind of, but it's also kind of a nice kind of celebratory kind of looking back at everything, you know, and kind of, um, you know, reliving parts of the, the series that have happened already as you watch the final film. It's kind of fitting and a really, really great maximum movie mode and it extends the film 
if you watch it all in one go to about two and a half hours so there's about another about 40 minutes of extra stuff with this picture and picture track and sometimes they pause the film and go back and you know you get loads of like insight it's really really good um, then we have focus points that can, can be played as the movie goes along which would probably extend the film to about three hours long uh, Aberforth Dumbledore two minutes long Deathly Hallows costume changes three minutes long these little featurettes Harry's return to Hogwarts three minutes long the Hogwarts shield two minutes long the room requirements set three minutes Neville's stand four minutes Molly takes down Bellatrix three minutes and they're just bite-sized featurettes to kind of just talk about the, the various things and they pop up as that scene is taking place in the film. Um, but you kind of watch it as a separate featurette or you can watch it from the menu. And then one featurette is also on the disc called Final Farewells from Cast and Crew, three minutes long. And you'll be seeing a lot of this kind of stuff through the remainder of the special features. Now, on the bonus disc, which is kind of what is kind of exclusive to this set and the ultimate editions uh, of the Deathly Hallows films, um, is Creating the World of Harry Potter. Potter Part 8, the final part of this epic documentary series which has been absolutely fantastic and it's called Growing Up. This might be the best one for me, it really delves into just the, 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 tran the transition, the progression of the cast, you know, starting out as kids and now as adults and really really good, There's so many great clips used and stuff, very emotional look at the progression of the film through the eyes of the actors who have grown up during the series and through, and through the cast and crew who saw them grow up also and their thoughts on that. Tons of input from primarily the main three, though contemporary interviews and interviews ranging from the first press conference before the first film was even made through all the other films, which is really good. I'm um, seeing their kind of, it's almost like boyhood, you know, seeing them all grow up like that when you think about it. A brilliant look at the growing up of the cast and a moving, fitting end to an incredibly well-made eight-part documentary series, perhaps the best of all eight parts, um, but yeah. Uh, then we have Harry Potter and the Death Hallows Part 2, Behind the Magic. Uh, one final ITV special hosted yet again by Ben Shepard, who is as enthusiastic as ever, on set for the final film, talking to all the cast and crew. Nice mix of behind-the-scenes footage, on-set interviews, and more intimate sit-down interviews also. Great little documentary with plenty of footage not seen anywhere else, as it uh, features a lot of stuff that was exclusively shot just for that feature. 47 minutes long. Uh, I didn't mention... Yeah, did I say that for the growing up documentary was 49 minutes long? I don't know. It is. Um... When Harry Left Hogwarts, an in-depth look on the final days of filming on Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. More on this in the final video of the series. Yeah, and that's uh, 48 minutes long. Hogwarts' is Last Stand, extended version. A very detailed examination of the final battle of Hogwarts from production design to stunts, character moments, filming the scenes with Voldemort in the courtyard and much more. Another great piece, 30 minutes long. The Women of Harry Potter, a great feature on the role of women in the world of Harry Potter, both in the books and on screen. All the key actresses who play big female roles are interviewed, and J.K. Rowling is extensively interviewed on her motivation in writing women in the series. So much better than you might think. I actually love this one. Great insight and a lovely story from Emma Watson about a night she spent with uh, Helena Bonham Carter. Brilliant stuff from Rowling too. Just really great. 22 minutes long. The Goblins of Gringotts. Uh, look at the extensive amount of work that went into creating tons of unique makeup and designs for the goblins for the scene in Gringotts. Goes into the design aspect as well as casting uh, so many short people, uh, etc. Fun, interesting feature. I quite like that one. 11 minutes long. The Great Hall of Hogwarts. Bit of a fluff piece, really. Not much new as expressed here. Cast and crew talk about the destruction of the Great Hall and what the location has meant to them over the years. Four minutes long. Ron and Hermione's Kiss. A dedicated look at the filming of the kiss between Ron and Hermione. It's been covered in other features so far but had um, even more footage, so for such a big moment it's worth the extra feature, I suppose. Four minutes long. That's a wrap, Harry Potter. Another more focused and dedicated short feature on the last day of filming with a look at the video that was put together over the whole shoot of the Deathly Hallows with cast members holding up the slate and so forth. Uh, quite moving and nice to see, uh, five minutes long. Neville's battle makeup, Matthew Lewis who plays Neville, uh, takes us through the application of his battle-worn makeup, the blood and the scars in his face and the burns on his hand, four minutes long. Uh, it seemed weird to kind of have just a feature out for him, uh, it was weird, but uh, the, the Gringotts disguises, a look at the disguises of Ron and Hermione and Gringotts, particularly covering Helena Bonham Carter's acting as Hermione disguised as Bellatrix and the process of the two actresses working that out really cool, four minutes long. Harry's death, the courtyard confrontation, a fairly in-depth look at the courtyard scene after Harry dies and Voldemort giving his speech, all the actors' thoughts on their moments and how the whole thing was put together, also a really good ten minutes long. And then we have uh, Harry Potter and Deathly Hallows of the Quest, uh, presumably a series of online videos released as a website is plugged at the start of every video, I think it's harrypotterthequest.com. Very cool that's been preserved here on this disc though. Uh, Secrets of the Cash Revealed, Emma Watson gets a red card, um, it's Emma Watson kind of corpsing on set, you know, uh, laughing when she shouldn't be, quite a fun one, two minutes. Daniel Radcliffe discusses his mentors, um, as it says, mainly focused on Gary Oldman, four minutes long. Uh, Ray Fiennes as Voldemort, um, uh, as played by uh, you know, Ray Fiennes. 
Uh, it's kind of uh, explored, you know, his thoughts on playing the character four minutes long. A look back at Severus Snape, an all too rare uh, input from Rickman on this one. And still sparse though, he doesn't really do many interviews about this. Uh, Constructed as a mini trailer of sorts, about three minutes long, and at the end it's like, you know, coming out or whatever. Uh, the magic behind the movie is revealed, the secrets of flight, Ben Shepard looks at the flying on the brooms, the building of them, and the special effects, four minutes long. Uh, exclusive footage from the Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, London premiere revealed. Very brief clips from the premiere, nothing too remarkable, but still some new stuff, two minutes long. The Love Life of Ron Weasley, cast and crew look back on Ron's love life throughout the series, fun little featurette, three minutes long. The Weasleys, a look back at Harry Potter's favourite family. Really good look at the Weasleys with input from all of them. Uh, great story from uh, Mark Williams about being out with the Phelps twins and uh, Rupert Grint, and you should, I'll, I'll leave you to see that one, it's a really funny story. Also nice to see all the old clips and stories of first days of them being a Weasley. I uh, really enjoyed this one, three minutes long. Dumbledore and Harry, a look back. Insight into Dumbledore's relationship with Harry, but mainly focused on the actors themselves. Uh, the passing of Richard Harris and Michael Gambon taking the role over. Uh, three minutes long. Favourite lines with the Harry Potter cast. A uh, bit of a breath of fresh air, this one. Uh, filmed at the press conference just before the world premiere. Uh, almost the entire cast of, of the Deathly Hallows recall their favourite lines. Only annoyance is we rarely hear them say the actual line. It always cuts to the films, uh, which by now surely everyone knows by heart, which is... Uh, but they're particularly kind of... Uh, obvious lines anyway, but still fun. Uh, either way, four minutes long. Uh, recorded from the same event, we have favourite props and costumes with the Harry Potter cast. Uh, they talk about their favourite props and costumes from their time on the films. Quite a cool one, three minutes long. Riding along memory lane, Warwick Davis trundles around the studio on a Segway in half made up Flitwick makeup, which is worth watching this alone. And tours some of the sets, realise some of his favourite mem uh, memories, another good featurette, four minutes long. Finding Luna, a dream come true, a short telling of the story of Ivana Lynch, getting the role of Luna, this time with footage from her audition, which is really interesting to see, and it's almost positive it wasn't used in previous documentaries. Uh, I'm almost positive, so I'm reading my notes here. Because, you know, the story of uh, Ivana Lynch kind of turning up and, and saying, I I'm Luna, and she used to write to J.K. Rowling saying, I am Luna, and then she turned up, you know, no acting experience, and... Uh, wowed them at the, the audition, and, or charmed them I should say, and that's how she got the role. Uh, two minutes long, a tribute to Dobby, the beloved house elf. Looking back on Dobby's most memorable moments, uh, given his character's fate, it's quite a nice little one to watch, three minutes long. A special message to the fans of Harry Potter, all of the cast say thank you from their respective interviews. To the fans, it's nice, but a lot of these snippets have been seen already. Though I suppose this was originally an online series, two minutes long. The cast of Harry Potter say goodbye, the cast talk about their thoughts on the whole experience with lots of appropriate clips used, uh, really sweet goodbye, you can tell so many of them loved it, to the point of it almost being unbelievable, uh, two minutes long. Then we move on to the deleted scenes, that has a lot of featurettes, there's so much content on just this one alone. Deleted scene, Shell Cottage, Hermione shows the hair of Bellatrix to Harry and Ron, then Fleur and Bill talk to them about their departure, and Bill warns them about making deals with goblins. Good scene, but I can see why it was trimmed out uh, one minute long. Harry and Luna at Dobby's grave, a poignant moment between Harry and Luna at Dobby's grave, which segues into the scene in the film where Hermione and Ron arrive um, in their disguises, two minutes long. Um, Ron's like, how do I look? And, Ron's, and Harry's like, if I don't... what do you say? He says something like... Um, I wouldn't know you if I didn't know you, or something like that. Kind of a funny line, but it kind of, I can see why it was cut as well, also. Um, Hog's Head, a short snippet with Aberforth being icy towards Harry about Dumbledore, one minute long. This is also kind of an alternate version of them being in the Hog's Head and they reshot it afterwards. Marble Staircase, Harry and Ginny, we see Harry join the ranks of students as they enter the Great Hall um, before you know, the, the conversation between Snape and Harry. And we see him grabbing Ginny's hand. Nice, but kind of ruins the element of surprise later on, 30 seconds long. Wooden Bridge, a very short clip of Seamus setting the charges on the bridge and Neville asking him if it's going alright. No special effects completed on this shot. 30 seconds long. Hogwarts Battlements, even shorter clip of Lupin and Tonks um, sharing a moment before the final battle, 20 seconds long. I really like that one, I wish I'd stayed in. Slytherin Dungeons, uh, Filch locks up some students and they break free after an explosion. We see Draco uh, drag off. Uh, Goyle and Zabini. Nicely done, but easily, easily trimmed out, 40 seconds long. Marble Staircase, Ron and Hermione, while running away from Nagini, Ron and Hermione share a tense but funny moment that was really great, but during such a seriously climactic part of the film, I can see why it was cut out 20 seconds long. Basically, it's after they've kissed and they run down the steps, and Ron's like, Hermione, I want to tell you something, and she's like, Ron, don't say something that you wouldn't normally say if we weren't just about to die, it'll just ruin it. <laughs> Which I thought was a really funny scene, but it's just as about as Harry's about to kill Voldemort, so it would have just kind of it wouldn't have um, fit with the tone of that moment in the film. Uh, and then we have Warner Brothers Studio Tour London, the making of Harry Potter, a short hype reel for the studio tour at Leavesden, which doesn't actually, for me, sell exactly what you actually you know, get to do there. Uh, I went for a few months after I went a few months after it opened, and it was spectacular. I loved it. Uh, I almost feel like they undersold it with this little uh, video, one minute long. 
uh, Pottermore preview, the same video seen online where J.K. Rowling cryptically, announce, cryptically announces Pottermore. Uh, nice to see this included for a completest point of view, one minute long. The teaser trailer, typically great teaser trailer, really sells the film well, two minutes long. And then the theatrical trailer, about as epic as it gets, really, really great trailer. And the final Harry Potter trailer ever, two minutes long. And that is it. Thank you for watching that. I mean, again, this is it. Um, how long have we been going for now? 34 minutes. Not as long as I thought. I thought I was going to rant a lot about the whole Voldemort thing, but, you know, for me, I wasn't expecting to read, actually, from the book that much, but, again, uh, thank you for bearing with me if you're still watching at this point, but there you go. Um, that was the... Um... Wait a minute. I forgot about the bonus disc. Well, I guess I'll just have to wait and do another video. Oh yeah. This isn't over. You thought it was over, but it isn't over. You see, I did the first couple of Harry Potter Odyssey uh, you know, parts, and then all of a sudden I released part nine. And people think, what's going on? Well, part nine is the making of the you know, Harry Potter studio tour, my video where I show you all the stuff that's in the, you know, the studio tour in Leavesden. Uh, part nine of the series, which came out before like part three or something. So once this is, this is out now, Part 8 is there, parts 1 through 9 are complete. There's going to be a part 10. Part 10 will be my review of the bonus disc, the illustrious bonus disc that is contained within this box set, and a final thought on the box set itself. So, stay tuned for that. Hope you enjoyed this. Um, any questions you have for me about the film, again, I didn't really review it that much, but you know, for me, I think it's a great film. I've definitely warmed more to it now, I've rewatched it and watched a lot of these special features, but um, yeah, um, for me I still prefer part one, I think, as a film, but uh, you know, sometimes for me the journey is a bit more enjoyable than the um, the payoff, which can be, the same can be said for me uh, with Lord of the Rings, as you can see it up there, um, you know, I love the Fellowship of the Ring, but you know, I'm, not, I'm not too keen on Return of the King, but anyway, thank you for watching, and uh, I'll see you with part ten. And of course, like every, almost every time I do these, I forget to show you the actual thing, or I forget to segue into the clip where I show you the actual thing. So, before we finish, uh, you know, well and truly, let's take a look at the actual packaging. Here we go. Okay, so Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part two, year seven, part two. And for the final film of the series, the Epic Eight part series, they've gone for another really random design. I don't get it. I <laughs> mean... Is that hard to just draw like, you know, I mean, they've almost got it there. Triangle, the line, just put a circle in it and it would be awesome. <laughs> you know, the, the Death Hallows symbol should have been incorporated, I think, in the design. But there you go, we just get random stuff like that for some reason. It's nice nonetheless, I mean, it's all nicely designed, but just not quite relevant. I mean, I think Chamber of Secrets, Goblet of Fire, and um, the half Blood Prince are really good cover designs. Uh, it seems to just skip skip a film every time and then there's just a random one like this but uh here we got the movie i really love this so the design on this is really cool I like that a lot synopsis of the film maximum movie mode and yes just for posterity we will look on the inside there we go This design just really work, works well, well around the edges, I think. Makes it pop and stand out, though. we got the DVD version of the movie. Harry, Ron, and Hermione at the, uh, the climax of the film, the Battle of Hogwarts. And the final, Creating the World of Harry Potter Blu-ray, Part 8, Growing Up. All the special features, trailers, and much, much more. And then finally, we have... The 3D, the 3D, um, the 3D version of the movie, and we have a picture of Voldemort there. Very cool. So there we go. Um, I think it was a kind of a bit of a disappointment, but in terms of design and stuff, because they had three really good designs on these books, and um, the other, the other hmm, five were just cool, but not really relevant to the. To the film, but there you go. Harry Potter and Deathly Hallows Part 2. Awesome stuff. Okay, we're finally at the end now. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for Part 10. Leave me a comment down below if you want, and I'll see you with the next one. I don't know, Father.